I'm a soldier, part of your rapidly expanding army that stands ready to defend the peace. I'm an airman, part of your new Air Force. Our guest for this show, Miss Frances Langford, has turned up at sick call and can't be with us, but she'll be here at a later date. Meantime, we'd all like to wish her a speedy recovery. For our show this week, we have music by the Dance Orchestra of the United States Navy Band and vocal soloist, musician second class, Julius La Rosa, Commander Arthur Godfrey's great singing discovery. And to give you a first-hand account of the battle action at the Chosan Reservoir in Korea, we have with us Hospital Corpsman Second Class Bruce McDonald, who was himself wounded in action. This edition of the Navy Hour, of the Armed Forces Hour, that is, is the Navy's. We have a film report for you on the what the Navy is doing to get your fleet out of mothballs and another of the fleet in action in the Pacific. But now, on with the show. Here's the conductor of the United States Navy Band, Lieutenant Commander Charles Brendler. Thank you, Julius. And I'm happy indeed to be here with you all. And now I want you to meet Tony Mitchell, who will lead the dance orchestra of the United States Navy Band. Take over, Tony, with a downbeat. Now that the show is underway, I'd like to tell you a little about what the Navy is doing to get your fleet back into action to help maintain the peace. No doubt you've seen pictures of the mothballing or zippering of the fleet at the end of the Second World War. Well, these ships are being taken out of mothballs as quickly as possible and returned to action. And that's what I want to report on now. When the guns and instruments were put in their moisture-proof plastic coverings after the last war, no one believed it would be such a short length of time before it would be necessary to remove them and put the fleet back into service. Now, instead of building an entire new fleet to meet the present emergency, mothballing has given the American people a reserve of naval power. 
vessels of all classes that have already been bought and paid for, thus saving untold millions of dollars of your tax money. So efficiently was the mothballing done that not one ship in the entire zippered fleet has suffered any major ill effects during its five-year period of storage. As orders went out from naval headquarters to each of the naval shipyards storing the ships, it was found that other than stripping the plastic coatings away, cleaning the exposed surfaces and checking all machinery, the job of recommissioning could be quickly accomplished. As the inspecting parties went aboard and made their first checks, they found the task before them would be relatively simple and comparatively inexpensive. They are followed by the recommissioning crew. Every gun, instrument, and mechanical part of each ship has to be inspected and re-inspected, checked and rechecked. Then and only then are the firemen given the order to light the boilers and get up steam. For once steam is up, a ship is no longer an inanimate thing. She has life and is capable of motion and also capable of responding to human command. All that remains before her shakedown crews is to give her her last facelifting, the last coat of paint. Then one last check before the navigator plots his course and the captain gives the order to stand by. As the hook comes up and the recommissioned ship gets underway, she is once again a proud member of the battle fleet. She is ready and fully capable of doing her part in any emergency. Should the day come when the radio flashes a message that will summon the crews to their battle stations, the zippered fleet of ships and guns and planes will be ready to meet the call. And that's the story of demothballing. From raging battle action to peacetime retirement, back to battle-ready condition to protect the peace for which so many fought and died. But right now, I'd like to introduce the Navy member of our group, Julius La Rosa, as he sings, I Should Care.
Julie will be back in just a few moments with another song and film report. But first, here again is Tony Mitchell and the Navy Dance Orchestra with an arrangement of Robin's Nest. In a minute, we're going to take you out to the Pacific and show you your fleet in action. But first, I've told you how the Navy was putting your fleet back into battle readiness. Now I'd like to take you out to the Pacific and show you some of the new developments we have made with anti-submarine warfare and battle tactics and give you a look at your fleet in action before it was put in storage. It has only been a little over five short years since these guns last thundered in anger at an enemy. Five short years since these planes took off to meet the enemy and came back only long enough to refuel and rearm before they took off again. And yet, the battle fleet is once more sending her planes into combat against another enemy. This time, the planes are newer models. Some of them are bigger than it was dreamed possible to launch from a carrier those few short years ago. But the war is much the same. Men still die in the same old bloody way they have died in all wars. But our methods of making war and preventing war have changed radically in these few years. Naval warfare is largely over the water and under it, rather than on the surface. And to combat the menace of the deadly submarines, we have devised new methods of hunting them down. We now use the blimp that can stay airborne for longer periods of time than an airplane to hunt the submarine. The new snorkel type can stay submerged for days without having to come to the surface to breathe or recharge batteries. The slow blimp working with fast hunter-killer radar-equipped planes, the destroyer, and other newly devised anti-submarine devices and weapons are jointly responsible for the safety of the fleet against hostile submarines. One of the most effective weapons is still the depth charge. Vastly improved and more powerful, the depth charge is still, to the submarines, one of the greatest dangers. In modern warfare, where amphibious landings are a standard operating procedure, the fleet's job is to soften up the beaches with fire from its heavy guns and carrier-based planes. And with newly devised ships built especially to act as rocket launchers, to thoroughly saturate an area with a rain of high explosives and steel. And to protect themselves from an aerial attack, the ships of our fleet have heavier and faster firing anti-aircraft weapons. To put up a curtain of fire that can make it almost certain death for any enemy airplane to press an attack. The fleet is rapidly regrowing to the size and effectiveness it had when it covered the marine landings on the beaches all over the world. 
coaches that have since become heroic names in American history. And that's the story of the fleet as it was in the last war. Here now with us is a man who knows the fleet is still softening up the beaches and putting the Marines ashore where they are needed. He is hospital corpsman second class Bruce McDonald, who went ashore with the Marines at Inchon and was himself wounded while withdrawing from the Chonjin Reservoir in Korea. Hello, Bruce. Hello. I imagine you feel about as happy as we do to be back here in the good old States. I certainly do. It's really wonderful to be back. Well, Bruce, I understand you landed at Inchon with the Marines and then went from there up around Seoul and then back down again to Inchon. And there you boarded an LST to go around to the east coast of Korea to Wonsan and then on up north from there. Well, would you give us your experiences, your personal experiences from about Wonsan? Well, from Wonsan, we were taken to Ham Hung by truck where we leave the ROK division fighting in that sector and far away on up to you damn knee on the Chosen Reservoir, which is as far north as any American troops went in that sector. Well, it was at Udamni where you were wounded, wasn't it? Yes, I was wounded on the uh, morning of November 28th when the Chinese started their big push, which later caused the Marines to withdraw back to Ham Hung. It was, uh, <clears throat> we, myself and five other men, had evacuated some of the wounded from our company and were going back in to help get the rest of them out when a flare burst over our head, and then we realized that we were in Chinese-held territory. Ooh, what a spot to be in. Immediately uh, on realizing that, we turned and started back. And at that time, another man and myself were wounded. Uh, when I was shot, I fell down over the bank there, which was about 20, 25 feet, and slid. When I quit sliding, I landed right beside one of the Chinese troops there. And I realized this time I couldn't walk or run, so my only chance was to play dead at the time and hope that he would think the same thing, which he did. Well, how long did you have to play dead, Bruce? It was approximately two and a half hours until dawn when the planes come in and the Marines retook the hill again when I got out. Two and a half hours. How did you feel about it? Oh, it was, it was quite an experience. It's hard to be described. Uh, three times during the night, the Chinese soldier laying beside me uh, used me as a brace when he was firing his weapon at our troops up on the hill. Wow, sort of a human sandbag. <laughs> Well, Bruce, uh, uh, how is it that I imagine a lot of our uh, uh, listeners would uh, like to know why the Navy is attached to the Marine Corps and land operations such as you were in? Well, the Marines do not have their own medical corps, and therefore the Navy furnishes all the doctors and corpsmen for the Marines in the field. In other words, more or less the doctors for the Marine Corps on the beach. I see. Well, Bruce, when you were up there in North Korea, I know it must be mighty cold up in that section. Uh, just about how cold was it when you were out there acting as that human sandbag? It was 17 below zero the morning that I would hit. Wow. <clears throat> and later it went even colder than that. I see. Well, Bruce, I'd like to thank you very much. Corman Bruce McDonald for appearing with us as our guest on the Armed Forces Hour. Now let's get back to our singing sailor, Julie La Rosa, as he sings, There's No You. Park that we walked in 
The garden we talked in, how lonesome they seem in the fall. Stormy clouds hover and falling leaves cover our favorite nook in the lawn in spring we'll meet again we'll kiss and recapture the summertime rapture we knew and from that day never more will I say that Now we'd like you to see Tony Mitchell as he leads the Navy Dance Orchestra in that all-time favorite, the Pagan Love Song. This week, the show has been the Navy's. We sure hope we've been able to keep you entertained. And next week, it's the Fighting Marines. At which time, I'll have a report for you on the training that has made the Marine Corps the great fighting organization that it is. And we'll also take you out to Korea to show you how that training pays off in combat. Portions of this program have been mechanically reproduced. The Armed Forces Hour has been presented from the studios of WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Dumont Television Network.